Pacers bounce back, beat the Clippers in L.A. Everybody had to step up to get it done, yet the Pacers did it. They stay in six. They get win number 41. It's all coming on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Tuesday, and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers. As always, my name is Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today it's over. The Pacific time zone is out of the Pacers schedule. The back-to-backs are out of the Pacers schedule. They're done with that. We're all done sleeping and staying up late. It's all over. Pacers win in L.A., they beat the Clippers. They get over their back-to-back bugaboos. And they crushed the Clippers. Really fantastic second half by the Pacers. And there's a lot of Pascal Siakam we'll dig into today. He was excellent once again. Tyrese Halberton made some threes. Miles Turner was awesome. And every role player deserves some praise for the way they played. And that's how the Pacers get a big win against a good team. We'll cover all of that as we roll through. A nice, important Pacers win on the schedule. Same night, the Sixers lost. Pacers climbing, kind of, in the standings. And I continue to think, I don't want to jinx it because it's like two weeks away, but that Pacers heat game in Cambridge in early April might be one of the games of the season for this Pacers team. We're going to talk all things Pacers Clippers today. Siakam's big game. Jairus Walker's best game of the season, maybe? I think so. I'll make my case. Bouncing back, Halliburton hitting threes, big sequences. Miles Turner was really good. And the chess match is where we'll start. Actually, where we'll start is I'm wearing my IU hat. Congrats to the IU women. Sweet 16 again. Very stressful game against Oklahoma, but it was fantastic. Big weekend outside of Pacers Lakers. Indiana State rolling through the NIT. Purdue to the Sweet 16 in the men's tournament. IU to the Sweet 16 in the women's. Pacers go 2-1. and one. Fun weekend for Indiana basketball in general. Let's talk about the chess match that was this game. Rick Carlisle versus Ty Lue. This was very interesting, right? So very early in this game, the Pacers were rocking with Miles Turner quite a bit. And that's because Avicii Zubac is slower. And he really struggled with pick and rolls coming right at him. And so Turner was getting to the rim or a ball handler was getting to the rim or a passing lane was opening up. A lot of stuff was happening, right? Turner in the first quarter had eight points already. He got to the line four times, right? That was really significant for the Pacers and their early start. Zubac in this game was minus 20 in 24 minutes. The Pacers just crushed him. And yeah, he does well in the glass, but he can't get enough stops. He's not additive enough to their defense, right? Uh, or offense, excuse me, in this matchup. And so that's how this game started out is Miles Turner was get, getting on this run to get eight points really quickly too in the first quarter. And so the Clippers, at first, Daniel Tice was at the scores table. Former Pacers big man, Daniel Tice. He was at the scores table. He's ready to check in. And then he ends up not playing at all. <laughs> at all. Neither does Mason Plumley. Instead, the Clippers brought in Amir Coffey and went small. Sometimes that was P.J. Tucker at center. He played 11 and a half minutes. Sometimes it was one of their star wings who both played a decent amount of minutes. Right? They had to get clever because the big lineups weren't working. Turner was killing them. And they needed a way to figure it out. And for us, a minute or two, it did work, right? The best stretch for the Clippers was in the first half as the Pacers tried to manage their small ball. And the Clippers got up, I think, eight in the middle of the first quarter. And they were up into the second quarter. The Pacers caught up and they were up at halftime with normal, more normal lineups in there. But the first adjustment went to the Clippers. So the second half starts. And now we have to go back to the start of the game before we talk about the second half. Big loss for the Pacers in this one. Aaron Neesmith was out. He had a knee bruise that he suffered against Lakers. He couldn't play. That was tough, right? So they started, Rick Carlisle opted to start Ben Shepard. Ben Shepard, I believe his first start of his NBA career in this game. He had to guard Paul George early in the game. It did not go well. Paul George had 11 points pretty quickly. And you're not going to knock Ben Shepard for not being able to guard Paul George as a rookie. But it just didn't go well, right? But what was going well in the first half was Jairus Walker. Jairus Walker was playing quite well defensively in the first half. And so what does Rick Carlisle do to get things back on track? He starts Jairus Walker in the second half. Brilliant adjustment. And Walker plus the starters was a good lineup. Walker in general had a very nice game, which again, we'll talk about more later in the show. But that adjustment was huge. Pacers came out starting the second half really well. So adjustment 
in favor of the Pacers. That was significant. They got their lead up to 10, and the Clippers took a timeout. what they do? Same thing they did in the first half. They went small. They had no center on the floor. Zubac was out of there. And for a little bit, you know, Miles Turner was in, but he came out pretty quickly after that. The difference was in the first half, when Miles Turner came out for the first time, even against a small Clippers team, Jalen Smith came in right away. Jalen Smith, a fine game. This time, Rick Carlisle said, you know what? If they're going to go small, let's fight back. Let's get some speed. Let's get some shooting on the floor. Let's try something else. Let's try Pascal Siakam at the five. And that is what really turned this game on its head. That is where the Pacers suddenly took off. I think it was Hall- I think it started. Um, I, I don't want to get this wrong, but I believe it started as Halliburton, Shepard, uh, Toppin, Siakam, and I can't remember who the third player was. McConnell might have been in there. I think it was McConnell, actually. And then Jalen Smith came in later, but for a while, that was really working, and Siakam was rocking at the four and just piling in shots as the Pacers went up by 10 late in the third quarter. And then early in the fourth, it was a bench group that did have Jalen Smith, but Siakam was just rolling. That group was absolutely clicking, but it was a lot of lineups that had never played together, and yet they were absolutely rolling in this game because the Pacers found the right counters to the Clippers going small. The chess match of the lineups between between Neesmith being out, between Zubach being totally ineffective against what Miles Turner was doing, made for such a fascinating game. So many lineups. Jenny Busick said this. Uh, Pacers assistant coach Jenny Busick was doing the halftime interview on Valley Sports with Jeremiah Johnson, and she said that. She said, yeah, we, they use lineups they've never used before. We use lineups we've never used before, right? And that made the first half really funky, and that continued into the second half. The Pacers line up with the most possessions in this game, not minutes, but possessions, because it was so fast, was Siakam, Smith, Walker, Shepard, McConnell, (laughs) right? So two rookies and Siakam. And by the way, that group was amazing, plus 11. That was the early fourth quarter group that really had big success. And then the other lineup you saw uh, that was kind of funky was Halliburton with McDermott and some bench guys. That lineup did pretty well. For about three and a half minutes. And then the center lineup, uh, the no center lineup I was talking about was Siakam, Toppin, Walker, McDermott, McConnell. That group was plus 10 in three and a half minutes, right? So the adjustments were huge in this game. And Rick Carlisle p- pushed all the right buttons, especially in the second half, to get the right lineups onto the floor and make this chess match one that favored the Pacers. Now, this wouldn't be possible if it weren't for the great play of a lot of players, specifically the ones who are playing unique roles. And we'll go into more depth on all these guys as we continue the show. But for example, if Pascal Siakam can't handle that stretch at center, that that falls apart completely. They can't go to that, right? They have to instead, you know, go with Turner and Smith the whole game. But they didn't need to do that in this one because they could go with Siakam there, even for just a tiny amount of time. That was a big success for them, right? And they, you know, they needed to play uh, Jairus Walker at the three quite a bit in this game. Jairus Walker played 29 and a half minutes in this game. That's a season high for him. We will talk a lot about him. He was very good. Very good. Plus 23 with Jairus Walker on the floor because he could hold up at the three in this game. He did well defending the stars. Uh, I'll talk about the specific moment. I thought I knew that Jairus Walker was going to have a good game among many things. There were actually one on each end of the floor. That had to be important. Doug McDermott had to not be a total sieve when he was out there. For his minutes, right? McConnell had to be awesome playing alongside Halliburton, and he was. He made a three. Everybody had to feel a little bit different of a role. Shepard had to start and guard, guard Paul George, right? He had two steals and five rebounds. He didn't. He wasn't that awesome offensively, but man, did he feel in defensively? All of that had to happen for this to be possible for the Pacers to be able to say we're playing a little different today. Some by necessity because we don't have Neesmith, and some because of the way this game is going, or because Miles Turner has been so good in this matchup. And Turner, also, I guess that's the other, the final piece of this being able to work. Turner, 8 for 12, 4 for 6 from deep, 6 free throw attempts for 24 points, a bunch of them right at the start of the game, and a bunch of them right at the start of the third quarter. So big momentum moments. He was awesome. Awesome offensively. Him being able to punish Zubac, especially a guy who almost had 30 rebounds against the Pacers last season. Turner's done much better in that matchup since. That was significant, and it all fell into place to allow the Pacers to have this kind of game flow where they figure out what their challenge is with the team they have, they adjust to what the Clippers are throwing at them and how the game is telling them to go, and they just absolutely kick butt in the second half. Pacers in the second half of this game, when they got to adjust and get the lineups out there they wanted, outscored the Clippers 68-54 to win this game by 17. Very impressive win for the Pacers. 
They're going to have a winning record on this road trip. They got to win on a back-to-back, and they're done. Back-to-backs are over now for the Pacers this season. They only have one more game, and it's on Wednesday. That isn't in the Eastern time zone. Even their road games after that Bulls game are all in the Eastern time zone. That's not like such an advantage. But after Wednesday, there are only three road games left. They're at Brooklyn, at Toronto, at Cleveland. Every other game's at home. Huge for the Pacers to get this win away. The Bulls game could even be more significant. Bulls have lost three in a row. If they beat the Bulls, they clinch the tiebreaker over the Cavs, which sounds convoluted, but I swear it's true. So much at stake for the Pacers, but they get a big one here over the Clippers in L.A., another win against the top-four team in the conference at the time, although now the Pelicans are fourth in the West because the Clippers lost. Jarris Walker, amazing. Pascal Siakam, fantastic. So much more to get to from Pacers Clippers. It's all coming up in right just a second on Locked On Pacers, but first, we have to talk about Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. You pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks is really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit an entry in less than a minute. They have quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and enormous selection of player stat types. For example, Kevin Durant, more than or less than 28 points in a game. Damian Lillard, more than or less than four threes. That's how you play Prize Picks for two to six players. And now it's demon time on prize picks. You can up to a hundred times your money with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into 1000 demons and goblins are the newest and most exciting way to play a prize pick squares marked with red demons and green goblins. Get you different payouts. You can own up to a hundred times your money with as little as four correct picks doing all that on prize picks. Go check it out. Pricepicks.com slash lockdown NBA. Use that code lockdown NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's pricepicks.com slash lockdown NBA. Use the code Lockdown NBA for a first deposit matchup to $100 at Prize Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. And we are back here on Lockdown Patriots. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Check out Lockdown Raptors. Maybe the most interesting story in the NBA right now. John Tay Porter under probe for suspicion. Not he, I don't know if he is or someone else is or whatever but suspicious gambling activity around Jonte Porter. Very, very interesting story. Locked on Raptor Sean Woodley. We'll have the latest on that. Some interesting developments coming out overnight about, <laughs> about all of it. It's very fascinating. Check out Locked on Raptors for more of that. Let's keep talking Pacers Clippers by talking about the – look, Pascal Siakam was the Pacers' best player. We will talk about him more. But the standout guy, especially compared to expectations, not even close, was Jairus Walker. Jairus Walker was awesome. His previous career high in minutes had never touched 27. He almost hit 30 in this game. 29 minutes and 24 seconds for Jairus Walker. And a team high, 20 plus 23. They dominated Jairus Walker's minutes tonight, the Pacers did. He had eight points, so not you know not the highest he's had. He's had 15, I believe, as his, his career high to this point. But he didn't miss. Three for three, he made both of his three-point attempts. That's how you get to eight points. And that's what the Pacers need to do. You know, Jairus Walker, if he's going to be out there, he's not going to be a creator really yet, although I'm kind of about to poo-poo that in a second in a good way. You know, he's not asked to do that, and yet in this game he was. Eight points, I believe, would be his fifth highest scoring night this season. Tied for fourth, excuse me, highest scoring night of the season, right? Four rebounds, good stuff. Seven assists was Jairus Walker. That is Jairus Walker's career high. His previous career high was six. This is when I knew he was going to have a good offensive game. There was a play. The Pacers missed the layup, and Pascal Siakam got the rebound. And Pascal Siakam was kind of well covered, or at least the Clippers were like aware of Pascal Siakam's presence under the basket. But there was like a little triangle of Pacers under the rim. And Siakam, realizing he has all this attention, flips it to Jarris Walker, who's also under the rim. And Jarris Walker could have, could have probably jumped up and scored, right? The Clippers had to turn around to face him and then kind of get to him. And he had enough of an angle to go up and score. But it wasn't a perfect angle. He was kind of like under the basket, even though, again, NBA players can score from there. But who was wide open and would have required another rotation from the Clippers defense and was facing the basket from an easier angle to score is Obi Toppin. And so Jairus Walker catches it with a pretty good layup opportunity and immediately like scoop flips it in the lane to Obi Toppin, who just immediately went up and scored very easily. And it was like this, boop, boop, the two passes and like the snap of the fingers and the Pacers scored. And I thought, okay, Jairus is reading this game well, right? He's got a good sense of what's going on, where the opportunities are, where he needs to be. And that is, again, the two things, I mean, the two most important things for his offensive game going forward 
he's gotten better at all season, right? His shot was clunky when he got into the league. He worked on it a lot. I'll never forget the practice where we were waiting on him to do media. And he was like, I'm not doing this until I ring the bell. If you don't know what ringing the bell is, the Pacers have this thing after their practices. They do this drill where they take five threes from each corner, each wing, and then the top of the key. So 25 total. You make 20, you get to ring the bell. He was determined. It took him a while. But he did it. And now he's like a good shooter in the NBA. And the sample is so small that I have no opinions on if he's actually going to be a good shooter right now. But 36%, 36.7, so basically league average on the season coming into tonight, made both of them. He's gotten better at it. And clearly in the G League, he was like a good enough three-point shooter watching him play. That's a big improvement. The other thing has been like the ball handling control and passing has gotten a lot better from the start of the season until now. So those two offensive things, the things he'll be asked to do the most offensively, pass and shoot, gotten a lot better. Really nice passing game today. Seven assists. To be clear, he had eight assists since the All-Star break <laughs> entering today, and he had played in all but five games in that stretch, right? He had gotten minutes. He was in the rotation for that stretch when they were dealing with some injuries, right? Like huge passing night from Jarris. Getting into the defense, finding the right passes, finding shooters, making plays. He was fantastic offensively. Again, if you don't miss a shot and you have seven assists and four rebounds, that's great. He also had a steal and had no turnovers and only two fouls in almost 30 minutes, right? That's good. He's he's has historically been jumpy. This quote will stick with me forever, but after that Bulls game they lost in overtime where they were relying on Jarris Walker to guard DeMar DeRozan for a lot of the game, and DeRozan was awesome, but Jarris did pretty well. He said, I would have fouled out of this game if this was early in the season. And it's not like he was like amazing on defense. And I mean, he was pretty good in this one. And you keep seeing the progress he's making on defense where he's not fouling as much. He's staying down. He's not gambling. He's not reaching his hands and he's not jumping passing lanes. Right. All of that is improved. And the moment I knew Jared Swalker was going to have a good defensive game was in the first half. He and TJ McConnell got locked into two man defense on a Kawhi Leonard pick and roll with Russell Westbrook and McConnell as the screener and screen defender. And Walker stayed with Kawhi and he fought through the screen and he had a little help from TJ shading, but he got over there and he got back on Kawhi and then Russ didn't get open and they got back to him. And then another screen, nothing, nothing came of it. And I think Kawhi gave it up and I think they actually scored on the possession, but it was like something else. Like Kawhi gave it away and then something else happened. I can't remember exactly, but I remember I tweeted after that, that play like, oh, man, <laughs> that was really good two-man game defense from Jarris. He was not letting it even get started. He was fighting through it. He didn't foul. He did a great job being up in his face. Like, that kind of stuff was not stuff he was doing earlier in the season, especially against those kind of guys, right? He routinely is needed in games where guys are in foul trouble, which usually means they're playing stars. So, like, he guards DeRozan or Kevin Durant or, you know, whatever. And this one, it's Kawhi Leonard. And he was great. He was great in that matchup. He stood his ground. He defended the right actions. He was in the play. Those two plays, the one where he was ping-ponging around under the basket and the one where he did that on defense, that's when you knew. If he's locked in like that on both ends, he's going to be playing well. Both of those were in the first half, and so in the second half, he starts, right? He, they needed him. And if you just look at the stats, you can tell. First half, he was making a huge impact, right? He came off the bench. He didn't actually start. But he made, oh, I just did the first quarter. I was like, that's not his stats for the first half. Yeah, first half, Jairus Walker, clear impact. He played 12 minutes and 32 seconds. He played the whole second quarter, five points and an assist, plus eight. And they were winning at halftime by three. And clearly it was working. His size was helpful in this matchup. And so they tried him out and started him in the second half. And he kept having an impact. 16 and a half minutes in the second half for Jairus Walker. That led the team. He played more than Siakam. He played more than Halliburton. Plus 15 in the second half, six assists, four rebounds, three points. That, to me, what, okay, he's had better statistical games, right? I already rattled off that he had a 10, a 50, he had that 15 point game in Sacramento where he made a bunch of shots and made the threes. He had the nine rebound game against Phoenix. He almost had that double double that night, right? He's had some like good, good NBA games, but complete with defense, totally contributing, being needed specifically in the rotation in this one. He was needed in Sacramento and Phoenix as well, to be clear. Uh, and actually the Chicago game, he was needed a bunch on DeRozan. Those three games plus this one are his best four games in the pros to me. But this one, given the defensive impact, and by far his best plus minus, which is not a tell-all, but in this game was, was reflective of how he played, this might have been his best game, even though the stats 
besides the assist, don't quite jump off the page. I thought this was Jairus Walker's best game. I thought it was his most complete game. You could see in individual plays progress he's made on key skills, and that's why he was so valuable, and that's why he played so much in a key win where the Pacers got it done. Big time from Jairus Walker. If Neesmith can remains out, he he has to play. It's not even a should he play. It's yes, he's going to play. Right? They only could they only have ten guys in their rotation. They cleared the bench late, so it's going to look like thirteen guys actually played. But the the bench was Toppin, McConnell, McDermott, Smith, Walker. Right? Like that's that's your group. That's what you have. Like McDermott's almost a two, and they stagger a bit. And Shepard started, so it's different. But like that's what they have. And so if Neesmith doesn't return, they need Walker to play. It's not should he play, it's how much. And in this game, it was a lot because he was fantastic. And that's what the Pacers needed on a night where they were missing guys. And credit to Ben Shepard while we're on the rookies. He didn't, I don't think he was like psyched about his start. Paul George had 11 points on five for six shooting pretty quick in this game. But Shepard still was fine. I mean, but again, like I said earlier, five boards, two steals, seven points on two for three shooting. Made both of his important free throws plus 13. Like he actually had a pretty solid game. He was again in the first half. He had one rebound, two fouls in five minutes and 41 seconds. Not awesome. In the second half, he really found his footing, did most of his damage, was clicking with that second group where he's played with a lot more. I don't know if he's just more comfortable with them or whatever, but he really warmed up in a key way, hit the three, hit a three in the corner during a big Pacers run that really put the game away. Credit to the Pacers, credit to the rookies. They all got it done. Big win for the Pacers and plenty more still to talk about from it including Pascal Siakam, who is terrorizing everybody. Holy cow, has he been good. He was once again amazing. In this game, we'll talk a little Siakam and a little more about stuff that stood out from this game. Halberton made threes, a lot of threes in this game. That's all coming to close out today's Locked On Pacers. This next segment is brought to us by our sponsor, BetterHelp. Sometimes you only need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased on your life. So today, I want to say how I really feel about something. You might even be thinking the same thing. I don't know if most of you know this, but if you do know it, and you've probably seen some discourse about it, the Women's NCAA Tournament has the first two rounds in a host site. IU hosted their games as the four seed in their bracket. I love it. Some debate about if it should stick because there was not as many upsets in the women's tournament this year. Well, they earned the right to do that, and I think that makes the Sweet 16 and onward even better because it's the best teams. I love it. I'm all for it. I hope they continue to do it. And I actually think the men should take it for their tournament as well because I want to watch the best teams in the Sweet 16, although I know the madness is a part of why other people like it. Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have much bigger problems in our life than how the first two rounds of March Madness is played or how our favorite sports team is playing, but it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while that are important to you. And therapy can be a great way to do that. If you've been thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. And so visit betterhelp.com slash LockdownNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash LockdownNBA. And thank you for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, of course, Locked On Clippers. Here with Darian Vaziri has to say about the Clippers losing, but the Clippers falling to fifth. They just don't look very good right now. Um, and the Pacers made them look not good to the Pacers' credit. But this team was at a stretch where they went 25-6 and six in 31 games. And then tonight, Paul George, 26 points on 18 shots. He shot 66.7%. Kawhi Leonard, 26 points on 18 shots. He shot 61.1%. That's good. They defended well. James Harden only took seven shots. I think I, I, Law Murray, who covers the Clippers, the athletic, had a stat. Like, this is the one three for James Harden in this many minutes. Like, he, he, that, I, it was the first time in a long time that that's happened. Zubac was woefully ineffective. Terrence Mann didn't do much. Russell Westbrook returned from injury and was pretty good. He provided a lot of energy. Norm Powell was probably the third best Clipper, but like, they just, they don't have a lot of lineups that make sense right now. Like they're just really scrapping for whatever they can figure out. And they just are older and slower. They need to figure out how they can be moving and connected more. It just felt very isolation heavy to me. I don't cover the Clippers. You should listen to Locked On Clippers because Darian does. And we have got to talk. I mean, we talked about Siakam yesterday because he was the big positive from the weekend, even though they lost to the Lakers. Siakam had 36 that night. This run he's on is insane. <laughs> this is he had one 30-point game for the Pacers before going to L.A. and then had 36 against the Lakers, 31 in this game. Tremendous. Just, just so good recently. Drilling long twos, 
over key defenders. A big stretch in this game, actually. I should have included this in the chess match part of it. it was late in the third quarter. I wouldn't say the Clippers were like surging, but they were certainly denting the lead, right? I think they got it to seven. They were down as much as something double digits in the third quarter. Uh, and they, they cut it to seven late in the quarter. They had a chance to get some momentum going into that. Uh, they had scored the la last three shots of the game. And then Siakam, who's being guarded by P.J. Tucker, just drills two shots. Boom, 17-footer. Boom, 16-footer. And the Clippers switch it up. So instead of having P.J. Tucker on him, it's Kawhi Leonard on him because they can't have that anymore. Now P.J. Tucker's on someone else, which still is a matchup to exploit, but like taking Kawhi off of someone else is important. And then Siakam scored the first two buckets in the first minute of the fourth quarter. That was his key stretch, and making the Clippers adjust to his success was huge. Like That's what having a guy who scores 30 points in consecutive games can do. Entering today, basketball reference, of course, doesn't put the games until the following day. He was averaging 26.6 points, 11.8 rebounds, and 3.4 assists per game in his last five. His last six game stats are now going to look ridiculous. He, oh, he has just been playing so well for the Pacers. A big part of why they're having success right now on the road, especially. Like, he is just playing excellent basketball uh, and it's guiding the Pacers. He's been their best player for, you know, most of March, if not all of it. Uh, and it's been huge. He was huge once again. That's what stars do. He was asked about it by Jeremiah Johnson after the game, like what it means when him and Turner and Halberton are all clicking at this level, right? And that was kind of the story of the game. Their stars were really great. He said, it's great when all of us are rolling. And later he said, when all of us are clicking and are playing our pace, we're hard to beat. I talked about Turner in the first segment. Again, his specific matchup with Zubac was like the key to getting all the chess match started. And he was really good. He deserves a ton of credit for that. So that's where he contributed. Siakam was, of course, amazing. Plus 20, 31 points. Let's finish with Alberton. For once, the th this is the stat I kept saying. If you were listening a lot when I was talking about Halberton's slump, I kept saying it's just that he's missing threes because, and then I would say this, his two-point percentage is awesome. Every game, he's making 60% of his twos still. His passing is still at the same level. The team's just not making threes, right? It, it's just that he specifically is not making threes. In this game, he was crap. He only made one, two. He was crap inside the arc, but he was awesome from three. Six for nine from deep. The Pacers shot 60.7% from three. They're going to win almost every time when that happens, among many things that went well for them. Uh, making threes was a good strategy, but he made six. He made his first four. I think he had 15 points at halftime, and all of them were from threes. And that's how you have 21 points and nine assists without being able to actually drive as much and score on the twos or distribute that way. He was still lighting them up. He was still Tyrese Halbert, and he still had nearly a double-double with 21 points. But making six threes in a game after the threes he made in Golden State, he's not out of the slump, right? He did not have – the Lakers, like athletic-sized teams, which there aren't many of in the league, that's what gives Halbert the most trouble still. The Lakers did it again on Sunday. But uh, recently, four for eight against – the Warriors from deep, two for six against the Lakers, one for three against Detroit. That's three games in a row at 33% or better, and now four in a row at 33% or better. That's a low bar to clear, but he only reached 33% or better three times since the All-Star break before this road trip started, <laughs> which is crazy to say. Once was the Detroit game right out of the break. Once was the Pelicans win at home. Once he was exactly two for six against OKC. That's it. That's the only three of the 13, first 13 games coming out of the All-Star break. Halliburton hit 33% from three. Now he's done it four games in a row, including two excellent games shooting. That's huge. Maybe not quite out of the slump yet, but getting there, and he played very well. The Stars were great. Jarris Walker was great. Rick Carlisle's adjustments were great. That's how you beat a top-four team at the time in the conference, in a conference, and the Pacers now have 41 wins. They're going to be at least 500 this season. They're very close to locking up at least the nine seed. They're very close to being done with their last road trip of the season. We have lots of coverage of this team coming here on the Lockdown Pacers podcast. We'll have a guest tomorrow to talk all things Pacers, Jarris Walker, and more. Doug McDermott did not play awesome against the Clippers, but had a better road trip or is having a better road trip than I anticipated. I'm going to talk about him. Lots coming here on the Lockdown Pacers podcast, and I'll be in Chicago Wednesday for Pacers Bulls to break that one down as well. We'll have another guest Thursday, so again, lots of fun stuff coming here. Hope you guys enjoyed this show and the game. Always fun when the Pacers bounce back and give us some interesting stuff to talk about like they did 
in this one. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you want more, you can follow me on Twitter at Tony R. East or the show at Locked On Pagers. Or if you want to discuss something, YouTube comments, another good way to do it if you're watching via the video where you can see my IU hat. Like I said earlier, looking forward to more March Madness in the coming weekend. Thank you all a ton for listening. Back tomorrow, talking more Pacers. Till then, everybody have a wonderful day.